This is CBC Here and Now. Bracing for the first winter storm of the season in St. John's. Look at that winter storm warning for the Avalon Peninsula tonight. And Ashley will break it all down for you. That's just ahead. And as the storm approaches, people are gathering at Confederation Building for the annual Christmas tree lighting. Carolyn Stokes is standing by live for that. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Let's get to the news. Everyone is talking about the snow. Ashley's out on the patio, so Ashley uh, looks pretty uh, stormy already. What can we expect? It's actually kind of like someone just shook the snow globe. And now, <laughs> and now it is absolutely beautiful out right now. I mean, it just literally started within the last half an hour. If we take a look at that satellite and radar, you can see uh, it's starting to push the snow further north. And we're going to see heavy bands as we head through the overnight tonight, especially for the Avalon. But it's the winds that are uh, going to be quite strong as well. And with that, uh, we're going to see some blowing snow through the overnight. We're going to see gusts right now. Uh, we're seeing somewhere between 50 and 70 kilometers per hour. Those are going to strengthen even more so as we head through the night tonight. Gusting upwards of about 60 to 80 kilometers per hour. We're going to continue to see that through the morning hours. We've got winter storm warnings for the Avalon Peninsula and then Buren Peninsula and up through Bonavista all under a winter storm watch. I'll tell you how much snow is going to fall tonight coming up in a little bit. All right, Ashley, in your element there. In other news, <laughs> after eight years in the province, a man who calls himself a true Newfoundlander says he has to leave the country. Michelle Rayner says he broke a rule he didn't know existed, and it's put his life and his family's up in the air. Here now is Ariana Kelland joins us with this report. Eight years of memories stacked in a storage unit. Memories of graduating Memorial University and ones from a world away on the streets of crime-riddled Trenchtown, Jamaica. Michelle Rayner has two weeks to go back to his home country. I'm a Newfoundlander for eight years, two months. <laughs> yeah, eight years, two months before I, I depart. Yes, indeed, it's a beautiful day here in St. John. Rainer arrived in St. John's eight years ago. Having worked at a Sandals resort in Jamaica, singing and dancing is what he did. He brought his positive attitude with him through his degree at Memorial University and eventually as a personal trainer. Newfoundland is a family-oriented place where I want to uh, reside. But earlier this year, he hit a snag. His employer cut one of the fitness courses he taught. Suddenly, he made $10,000 less a year. I couldn't uh, meet my bills and my, my regular livelihood and also take care of my diabetic mom back home. So I had to think on my feet as I've been doing since I'm 19, sending them to school right through uh, kindergarten. I have to try to find a way to uh, keep providing for them. So he did what many other Newfoundlanders have done before. He went away for work. But when he landed in Halifax, he was told he had lost his chance at permanent residency. I was distraught. I was weak to the knees. I cried at the airport. I feel as if I let everyone down. Rayner was nominated by the province to work and live here, but one of the stipulations of the provincial nominee program is that he would have to intend to live and work within the province. It is a rule that needs to uh, be followed, and it's sad that I have to be one of the person who fall in that role, that black and white. Even though Rayner says the move was temporary, he's been told he has to go in two weeks. Left to shoulder the financial burden is his younger brother Shaquille, who Rayner worked for years to get to Canada. At 23, he works two jobs and is doing seven courses. My first goal was to get my mom here, but as every mother would do, she said to get her two young kids first before she leaves. So. I promise her that I will do that for her and uh, I've been working on that since I moved here for school. A promise almost fulfilled, a family close to being reunited. 
For now, Rayner's possessions will remain here in hopes for a speedy return. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. And Arianna is with us in our studio. So Arianna, not long ago, I understand you received an update on the story. Yes, we do have an update. I just got off the phone with Michelle Rayner and earlier spoke with MP Nick Whalen. Both provincial and federal governments have been working today to figure out a solution for Rayner. And the update is that he does not have to leave the country in two weeks. According to Rayner, the province opened up his work permit so he can work, but he still may have to head to an appeals hearing in the new year. That was something he feared because he was afraid that it would result in a temporary ban from the country. But for now, Rayner is remaining hopeful. And as for Nick Whalen, he says it was encouraging to see the outpouring of support for Rayner. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Arianna Kelland. Lady Joyce is demanding an apology tonight from the Commissioner of Legislative Standards. His lawyer has sent a letter to the House Management Commission. The MHA for Humber Bay of Islands was accused of bullying and harassing some fellow MHAs. He was cleared of all those allegations, but Bruce Chalk did find him guilty of violating the code of conduct when trying to get a friend a job. Now, in the letter, his lawyer says that Joyce never got a chance to meet with Chalk to present his case and defend himself before the final reports were submitted and released publicly. The lawyer argues that the error is so egregious that it makes the report unfair, incomplete and unreliable. And when it comes to violating the code of conduct, the lawyer says Chalk incorrectly applied the code to this case. It says this complaint dealt with a complaint between members. It did not deal with a complaint as between an employee and a member as envisioned by Principle 10. The lawyer says he is looking for a reversal of the finding against Joyce, an acknowledgement of the unfairness of this process and an apology to him. Now, Joyce spoke to me today about this letter. I'd like to have it out in general public that I was never interviewed. And then when Bruce Chalk met with the Management Commission on October 24th, he said, I wouldn't participate in the process. Uh, as you see, I have documentation here right. that, that that's completely false. So you're telling us that the, the commissioner never sat down for a face-to-face -face interview with you during the entire investigation? I was never, ever sat down with the, uh, with the commissioner right. or Reuben Tomlinson on any of these issues. It's unheard of. Now, the Management Commission confirms that it has received the letter and will provide a comment once the Commission has discussed it. Joyce has also taken issue with an interview I did with him back in April. We're going to get into all of those details and more in my sit-down interview with him in about 25 minutes. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary has officially opened its newest attachment in the growing community of Conception Bay South. The addition of a new office will allow police to enhance its service to CBS and Paradise. Today, they held the official ribbon cutting. And with that, the town of Conception Bay South has the newest police station in the province. With the police station comes much needed officers to the town and significantly cuts down on response times. While the station has been in order for a short while, today was the official opening with a special ceremony attended by a number of politicians, many speaking about the need for this in CBS. You know, we're the second biggest community now in, in the province, 26 plus thousand people. So, you know, we have all the elements of a second biggest community. You know, the city of St. John's is a, is a, a great city and we're all proud of it because the stronger that is, the stronger we'll be. But again, you know, a lot of it filters out. A lot of the things, minor crimes, we see break-ins more often. And, you know, we're on the belt of the most of the population. And certainly we, we have all the crimes that the rest of the province has. And it, so it's, it's important that we have this presence. The new detachment is housed in the former town hall, something the community has wanted for a long time. The renovated building houses a criminal investigation unit, patrol services, a canine unit, and traffic services. The new RNC office will uh, be led by Inspector Alex Brennan, who was handpicked by Police Chief Joe Boland. It is uh, quite an honor to be able to be here and to serve uh, the, uh, not just the members of the community, but for the men and women that work really hard here. Uh, I think my main job is to build relations with that community and to set these women and men up for success in all of their uh, duties. And for Chief Boland to give that to me, uh, it is quite an honor and uh, I plan on getting to work on fulfilling those duties right away. 
Indigenous groups in Labrador are applauding the federal government's new stance on Indigenous children in care. Now, last week, Ottawa announced its plans to hand over the control of child welfare services to First Nations, Inuit and Métis groups. Here now is Jacob Barker has that story. No more lost children who don't know their language, their culture, their heritage. Minister Jane Philpott bringing the news directly to the Assembly of First Nations meeting in Ottawa this week. Federal legislation co-developed with Indigenous groups set to be introduced in January. It will put First Nations, Inuit and Métis groups at the helm when it comes to providing services for children in care for the Innu Nation. This news was a long time coming. The point that, uh, that the Innu Nation been making for, for a long time is not to remove children within both communities of Shihajija and Atwashi. And I think uh, what we need to remember is that the Inu Nation are on board and, and they will have a say in the, in the system that's, that we've been saying that has been broken for a long time. Inu Nation has long been advocating for a system which will keep Inu children in their communities, important for health, important for their identity. We need to keep our language, we need to keep our culture, and we need to keep our identity. The things that we lose uh, as an Inu really affects the ability of, uh, of our young people. Even one child outside in an icy wood for an extended period of time is one too many. In Nunatsiavu, the government says roughly 60 children are placed outside their communities. It wants to see them back home. But their, their families, their kinships, their friends, their schooling so they can do their traditional things, hunting, fishing, gathering, being part of the community. But questions still need to be answered. How the new system will be implemented and what it will look like still needs to become clear. We want preventive measures. We want to work with our families. We want to work with other levels of government as well. We want to see our children and keep them here safe with their families where they belong. One of them is, is the funding and uh, how, how, is that going, how is that going to go and uh, what resources do we have and what resources do we need throughout this process. Well, this goes ahead, so will an inquiry into Inu Children in Care. Grand Chief Rich says that the province and the federal government need to hear stories firsthand of what happens when children are removed from their communities. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. The construction company Pentacon has been hired to start work on the Muskrat Falls Generation Facility. Now Core CEO Stan Marshall made the announcement today in a news release. The work has been contracted to mitigate cost and schedule risks to the project resulting from Astaldi's shutdown. Astaldi Canada was the main contractor on the Muskrat Falls construction site, but was forced to leave in October when Nalcor cut ties with the company. More than 120 non-unionized Astaldi workers are still waiting for their final checks. Marshall says Pentacon will begin sending workers to the site immediately. He says work by other contractors on the project will continue as planned. A high-ranking civil servant who was the government's key contact with Nalcor is questioning the trust he put in the Crown Corporation before Muskrat Falls was sanctioned. Charles Bowne was testifying for a second day at the public inquiry into the cost overruns and delayed start of the project. Bowne was the associate deputy minister in the Department of Natural Resources in 2012. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Charles Bowne has been promoted since the mega project was sanctioned, but back then he was a top official with natural resources. And Bowne says the department had unwavering trust in the information it was given by Nalcor. But now that faith in the Crown Corporation has been challenged. Challenged when he learned that Nalcor knew it was highly unlikely it was going to complete the project on time, but didn't tell government. And to know that the schedule, which we had firmly believed, was, was going to be uh, the power, first power in 2017, and that was driving all of our actions, uh, everything that we were doing with respect to the loan guarantee and the pub review and et cetera, to find out that it was P1, again, that was, was a bit more than a shock. Inquiry lawyer Barry Lermont asked Bown if he still trusts Nalcor. Uh, we'll see at the end of this inquiry when all the information comes out. Well, what, based on what you're seeing now, do you still have that high level of trust in Nalcor? I have some questions that still require some answers. From who? 
Uh, we'll wait till Mr. Martin testifies. Bound believes changes will come because of this inquiry, but he didn't want to say exactly what changes are needed because he continues to work with the provincial government as chief executive of major projects with the cabinet secretariat. But Bound did say he expects Commissioner Richard LeBlanc will make recommendations that will change the way government does its work. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the festive spirit is coming to Confederation Hill this evening. It's the annual Christmas tree lighting ceremony tonight. And our Carolyn Stokes is live uh, at Confederation Hill. <laughs> How's it looking out there, Carolyn? <laughs> or do I need to ask? Oh boy, <laughs> Debbie, uh, the weather outside is frightful for sure. It is not nice out here on Confederation Hill tonight, but uh, you know, there's nothing like a good dose of freshly fallen snow to get you in the festive uh, spirit and that's what's happening here tonight. Most people are indoors right now and you can see why there's some hot chocolate and some music indoors, but uh, pretty soon we will be uh, basking in the glow of 60,000 Christmas lights. You can see the massive tree behind me in front of Confederation building that's going to be lit up with lights in about 10 minutes from now and that will stretch all the way down uh, to uh, Memorial University. All of those lights, 60, thousand of them so it's going to feel very Christmas here <laughs> Christmassy here very uh, soon now this marks the 32nd uh, year for this annual event and it's actually part of a national celebration called Christmas lights across Canada uh, capital cities across the country will hold tree lighting ceremonies just like this one to symbolically link uh, Canadians during the holidays so uh, every year they do choose someone very special to uh, flip the switch for the lights and that's happening again this year a five year old Natalia Williams will be flipping the switch. I was speaking with her a little while ago and she's very, very excited about it. So coming up in about 10 minutes, we'll check back in with you guys and show you uh, all of the beautiful lights. Hopefully we'll be able to see it through the snow. <laughs> Reporting live from Confederation Hill, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now.
Welcome back. It's time to talk a little more about the yep. weather. And Ashley, from the time that you opened up the show until we just saw Carolyn on Confederation Hill, it has really Snow come holds, down. Literally. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we knew that when the storm would come in that it would be pretty quick, and that was the kind of the severity or the urgency towards the storm, because when it starts falling, it's not going to stop, and it won't, uh, at least through the overnight tonight. We're already seeing reports of uh, some buses not being able to get up hills in Kilbride, so uh, if you are out on the road tonight, just definitely, uh, definitely keep yeah, that in mind. The snow was kind of gently falling on you, and it was like blasting Blowing. Carol's face, yeah, right? Yeah, so depends on changed. where you are with yeah. those winds, yeah. So if we take a look Look at how much snowfall we are expecting on the Avalon. That's where we should see the most. So somewhere between 15 to 25 centimeters falling from now through to tomorrow morning. And then that number uh, drops off as we head west. So we're going to see about 10 to 15 centimeters for the Beeren Peninsula, Clarenville area, and then up through Bonavista. And then towards Gander, that number closer to 5 to 10 centimeters. And then towards the coast, that number drops off quite significantly. A trace to 5 centimeters of snow is what we're expecting. So we do have that wind winter storm warning in place uh, for the Avalon Peninsula and then winter storm watches down through uh, the Buren Peninsula and that's because we're going to see these winds pick up as we just mentioned and stay quite strong. So with blowing snow, uh, heavy snow at times, we are looking at reduced visibilities near zero visibilities as we head through the night tonight. And you can see uh, on satellite and radar just how much uh, has already or how strong that uh, bands of snow already are and then we'll uh, see that heavy snow as we head through the night tonight. So those temperatures are actually going to climb as we head towards the morning hours to about zero degrees for St. John's. Marystown about minus one. Gander's going to stay quite cold, though anything uh, west of that will stay around minus six for Corner Brook. Again, we're looking at that snow through the overnight. Those northeast winds gusting anywhere from 70 to 80 kilometers per hour tonight. And then up through Labrador, uh, not a bad night. We are looking at some lingering flurries, though, for Happy Valley Goose Bay. We could see about five centimeters by the time uh, tomorrow evening rolls around. So fit minus 15 overnight tonight. That wind chill feeling closer to minus 21 and then minus 24 wind chill for Labrador City. And then Nain's actually going to see that temperature jump up to about 10 degrees by morning. So here's a look at the uh, future tracker. We can see that heavy snow. The, the low is well offshore, uh, and that's why we're seeing all of that snow because we're in the cold sector of it and that will continue through the day tomorrow in behind it we'll see some lingering flurries now by morning we should see this taper off at least taper to flurries even see some clearing skies through the afternoon so That'll be good news for clearing efforts. Now, as far as uh, snow closure or rather school closures go, I don't have a good idea of what will happen, but uh, likely we're looking at things being a little bit delayed through the morning hours. And then uh, through the West Coast, could see some onshore flurries through the afternoon. And then we're keeping our eye on a low pressure system. All of uh, that will track towards the coast of Labrador, and that's where we could see some significant snowfall for the weekend, uh, upwards 30 plus centimeters with some strong winds as well. So it doesn't look like a nice weekend there. Uh, so as far as tomorrow's forecast goes, again, snow in the first half of the day with that blowing snow eventually going to clear out. Minus two should be the afternoon high, minus five in Gander. That temperature is actually going to drop uh, through the day. And then Corner Brook minus two through the day, and then up through Labrador again, see about five centimeters of snow for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Nain minus eight with some flurries possible. And then uh, Lab City sitting at minus 15 through the day tomorrow. So let's look at your forecast for tonight. Tomorrow we'll look a little bit ahead because it looks like there's more snow on the way coming up in a little bit. Thank you, Ashley. Well, a well-known local musician is going to go under the knife for a cause, but it's not what you might think. Shannon Ganuck's Chris Andrews is putting his beard on the chopping block, all to help raise money for a family in Flat Rock. Here now is Jeremy Eaton has the details. It's hard to know where the beard ends and the man begins. I've had one since I was a kid, you know, because back then we just wanted to be Ryan's Fancy and Sons of Aaron and Ralph and the, the boys had big beards. And then it just sort of became real and part of me, you know. In the last two decades, he's only shaved it off right. once. But now he's living on the razor's edge, all, all right. for this 11-year-old girl. Jess. Jess has Rett syndrome. She cannot talk. She cannot move. She cannot use her hands or move around much. But she can hear us, she can understand us, and she's a very smart person. Rett syndrome has taken a lot of things from her. I mean, she, she can't do all the things, you know, like her 
uh, 11 month younger sister here, like, you know, sit up next to dad and be on television and, and talk and, you know, do, do the normal things that normal kids do. Her family started fundraising back in June to try and get the money needed to buy a wheelchair accessible van. We're at $30,000 so far. Our goal is 80. It's going to take us a little bit to get there, but um, Jess is 80 pounds. Jessie's wheelchair is 40 pounds. So right now we physically lift her in and out of our van. Uh, as she gets bigger, the wheelchairs get bigger, but you know the vans don't get bigger. So if if we don't find uh, you know a, a safe, reliable ride for her, I mean she, she's basically not going on any more outings with us, yeah. and that's not the way that we want to live life. She goes where we go. Andrews didn't know the family until recently, but now he's doing whatever he can to help, including putting together a GoFundMe campaign. Well, if we can get the money, I'm willing to get rid of the old beauty here. I'm very fond of it, but uh, in, uh, for just to get a new, uh, a new van, I'd be willing to shave this beard off. Andrew says if they can reach the goal, he'll shave off the beard live on Facebook, make his face more visible to improve mobility for Jess. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, Flat Rock. It's Canada's National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. It's also the 29th anniversary of the École Polytechnique massacre, still the deadliest mass shooting in our country's history. The murderous rampage targeted women working to join a male-dominated field. The shooter had said that feminists ruined his life. Here now is Katie Breen is live tonight from a vigil honoring the 14 victims of that 1989 attack. Katie? All right, well, obviously, we're having some uh, difficulty with uh, Katie's audio there. Can so you hear me now? All right, Katie, um, obviously, you're at this important vigil. Um, what's going on? Well, the vigil's being held at Munn's engineering building in the room just behind me. Most of the women killed at Ecole Polytechnique were studying to become engineers. So now the room that they're being remembered in, that's where students here, women here, are still studying the same subject. Tonight, names of the victims will be read aloud one by one. There are candles representing each of them. Speeches are going on now. There's talk of how things have changed in the nearly three decades since they call Polytechnique and what has stayed the same. Because as much as tonight is about what happened in Montreal all that time ago, it's also about the issue of gender-based violence today. Just before the vigil started, I met with Jenna Walsh and her mom, Donna Walsh. Jenna's a second year engineering student and a cousin of Courtney Lake who disappeared a year and a half ago. Her boyfriend was the only named subject in her vanishing. He has since killed himself. Yeah, so being involved in this vigil tonight is going to be really meaningful for me because I am a female engineering student myself, as many of the women who were killed at Lake Hull Polytechnique were. So honoring their lives and the fight for violence against women will be uh, really important. But also I am the cousin of Courtney Lake, who was murdered in 2017. So um, violence against women has become uh, much more personal issue for me over the past couple of years. So all of that will be running through my mind. Corny being your cousin, how, how do you connect to her today on a day like today? She, she's been on my mind a lot today and for this vigil for women who have lost their lives to violence, um, she is a really important factor to why I'm even here today. And Donna, you're Courtney's aunt. Yeah. Uh, what are you thinking about tonight? Well, it's just an emotional time, right? Um, violence against women has to stop. Uh, Courtney was in a violent relationship. She reached out for help. The system failed her. Like nobody was there to protect Courtney. And there's many women out there today in the same boat. And they need our protection. They need the system's protection. And uh, it has to stop. We need to help them. What would you like to say to those women? You need to get help. You need to reach out. You need to keep uh, reaching out. Don't stop and get out of the relationships. Get out of violent situations because it's, it's not healthy for anybody. And uh, I mean, in our case, we lost Courtney. Um, it could be someone else tomorrow and it will be somebody else tomorrow, but 
it's just um, we need to help these women and girls out there. The Code Polytechnique, that of course happened almost 30 years ago. How do you think that this issue, gender-based violence, has changed in that time? I guess there's probably more awareness now of it, but it's not enough. You know, like, there's women, there's girls out there suffering, they're in relationships they can't get out of, or they think they can't get out of. But there's lots of help out there, they just need to reach out, they need to ask for help. That was Jenna and Donna Walsh, relatives of Courtney Lake. They're both inside now, taking in yet another vigil on gender-based violence. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. A bully? I don't think about it. I'd like to have it out in general public that I was never interviewed. Eddie Joyce is demanding an apology from the Commissioner of Legislative Standards. He says his reputation is ruined. And he's upset with an interview I did with him back in April. That full interview is next. I am the MHA who lodged the formal complaint against Minister Joyce. How can you be a bully if you're dealing with everybody in the House of Assembly? The new information became available today 
We've reviewed the tapes now. I've met with Mr. Joyce. Unfortunately, today, my name has been put out in the general public. I've directed, and he's volunteered now, to remove himself from caucus. So that decision has been made. Well, it was the story that dominated the House of Assembly and provincial politics this fall, bullying and harassment, and it isn't over. Former Cabinet Minister Eddie Joyce is demanding that Bruce Chalk apologize to him for harming his reputation. The Commissioner of Legislative Standards exonerated Mr. Joyce on all of the bullying allegations against him, but he was found guilty on one count for violating the MHA's Code of Conduct. This for pressuring fellow Cabinet Minister Sherry Gammon Walsh to hire a friend for a job. And Eddie Joyce also takes exception with something that I said as this story unfolded, and he joins me now in the studio. Uh, Mr. Joyce, we have a lot to cover. Yeah. So let's start with a letter your lawyer sent today. Yep. What do you want? Well, I'd like to have it out in general public that I was never interviewed. And then when Bruce Chalk met with the Management Commission on October 24th, he said, I wouldn't participate in the process. Uh, as you see, I have documentation here right. that, that that's completely false. So you're telling us that the, the commissioner never sat down for a face-to-face -face interview with you during the entire investigation? I was never, ever sat down with the, uh, with the commissioner right. or Reuben Tomlinson on any of these issues. It's unheard of. All right, well, it certainly raises questions about the, the process, and which nobody in the aftermath seems to be very happy with. Now, let's go back to April. Sherry Gabman Walsh made a complaint to the premier yep. about you. And from the minutes of that meeting, her complaints at that time were that you turned your back on her, uh, that you at times grunted and that you glared at her. So what happened to those complaints? I, I have no idea. On, on April 25th, when the Premier called me up, they were the complaints uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, made to the Premier about me. And I said, you know, what? And then of course I was shocked. You've got to be joking with these complaints. Uh, Joy Buckle, uh, who was at the meeting, uh, she, she took notes. The secretary with the... Uh, she, she's a senior policy person with, with the, the Premier. premier yeah. With the Premier. She took notes. Right. She presented the notes to the commission that the swimming pool project, right. the compost, the job was never laid a complaint. Now these are a whole it. bunch of specific allegations that Sherry Gambin Walsh would later to present, an right? So why did those complaints change? She accused you of a bunch of things. Well, I, I think when it, made, when it got out in public, when it got out in public that uh, and of course, there's, I know how it got out in public, got a good idea how it got in public. Uh, but what happened, uh, Anthony, is that when she realized that it was out in the public, and these were complaints and they were so minute, I mean, like the glaring, the glaring, grunting. And, and walking by, turning back in a swivel chair, turning yeah. your back in a swivel chair. It was two and a half months later that I got the full documentation. All these complaints weren't even included, all new complaints. And of those complaints, only one was agreed upon by the commissioner. Only one, yep. And mm -hmm. so all of the bullying, all of the harassment, that was thrown out. That was thrown out. Right? Yep. But you were found guilty of violating the code of conduct, Co yep. right? This for allegedly, well, now you've been found guilty of violating, for trying to get a friend a job, yep. right? So you want to explain what happened there? Uh, I, I did hand in a resume, going back in Sean Dutton's own words, in, in September. Now September, he's the October. deputy minister? Deputy minister, uh, a person who, who I said anything comes up in Cornerbrook, well-qualified person. Right. This person then uh, went and applied for a job. The job opened on, on November 17th. Right, it was a good job, right? It was a nice job, manager job in Cornerbrook. Well, I thought he was well-qualified. Yeah. No, November 17th, it closed December 1st. He applied personally through the portal. In my testimony, the person who did the interview mm -hmm. was never contacted. Sean Dutton admitted he was never contacted. Well, you say your testimony, but you just said that you were never interviewed. Uh, so in my written, my written, written submission. My written, written submission. Okay. It was my written submission, never contacted. Yeah. I even asked the PSC to do an investigation. And the PSC is the Public, Public Service, Service Commission, Commission yeah. oversees the job competition. They yeah. came back, I think it was July 16th, and said we had no complaints about this competition. Okay, now Gammon Walsh says you really leaned on her, right? Yeah. That you were relentless and you wouldn't give it up. You kept saying, listen, and you weren't happy. Yeah. She yeah. says you weren't happy. And she also said that she, the guy wasn't really qualified, right? He, he wasn't qualified. He never even got an interview. It was a dead issue. Uh, but I, were you I, upset by this? No, that she didn't, if, she, if he wasn't, he, I had no influence because I never spoke to the people who was doing, right. and, and just because Ms. Scammonwall said it, you know how many times she said I spoke to her? Three times in seven months. So how much leaning can you put on someone? Mm -hmm. If you notice in the report, it said all in passing. Right. All in passing was never ever. I went on a, I went on a uh, eight hour trip with her at Presentia, March 6th. You know how many times we discussed that? Zero. You know how many times we discussed this just job competition, this person, from January till April that all this broke? Right. You know how many times? Zero. 
So, 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 so you're suggesting it wasn't that big a deal? It was never a big deal. Okay. And, and if you look at it, you look at her own testimony, her own testimony, it was, and Reuben Thompson even got in his report. He said it was all in passing. And Mr. Scamwell said, that's what we do. So he's, even his own report, Reuben Thompson said, this is normal to hand in resumes. He said it himself. So just to understand, in terms of when Premier Dwight Ball decided to, he couldn't have you in the caucus, how did that, how did that come down? Did well, he... Did he say, hey, Eddie, you got to go, you got to quit? In, in, the, in the cabinet process, uh, he asked me to step aside, and I, I refused to step aside from cabinet. I called the premier that night. I said, I refuse to step aside from cabinet. You, you have to remove me because I did nothing wrong. So you told him he had to fire you? Well, he told me he had to remove me because it's his right to any once to right. sit, and it is his right. So why wouldn't you step down? I mean, he's a friend of yours. He's telling you, Eddie, you got to go. If, if I had to step out of uh, cabinet, I would have uh, almost admitted guilt. And I feel very strong that there was no guilt. So I had to say, look, I feel strong. Right. There was nothing here, especially when you see the allegations of, of turning your chair in a swivel chair and back onto somebody. These, these seem minor to you, right? The, mi the yeah. minor. And, right. and then, of course, because it went to the media, because the opposition got hold of it that day. Yeah. And, of course, as you know, that day it went through. And through the documentation I got, we know she had code names in her phone for Tracy Perry, Tammy. I mean, and then Conservative you, MHA. Conservative MHA. And by the time three people had the meeting, Joy Buckle, the Premier, Sherry Gam Walsh. 12.30, 1 30 a day, Paul Davis had all the information of that meeting. I wasn't even involved with the meeting. So you're saying your cabinet colleagues were leaking stuff to the opposition? When you see a code name in, in documentation that I was asked, I couldn't even get the information until I had to sign a confidentiality agreement. Right. I refused to do it. And then after threatening to go to court on the third occasion, we got the information two and a half months later. Right. And in it, it says, code name Tracy Perry. And then everybody was wondering, how did the opposition get in this? Can I confirm? Well, I know the press gallery were sort of wondering, where's Paul Davis getting all this stuff? Yeah. So there was always a, a rumor. Let me ask you this. Do you feel like the fall guy in all this? Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It was all over the compost. Uh, all over the compost. And, and this is the compost in Placentia, Placentia that Sherry Gammon Walsh did not want, want to, go to go ahead. Ahead. And I was going through the environmental process, the environmental yeah. assessment process. And I explained to her on many occasions, we got to let the process unfold. Uh, I know she, she, she was sending me yeah. uh, texts saying, cancel that GD compost. I know she was cocking towns, put towns to put, urging towns to put letters in against the compost, against me. Right. Uh, uh, continue on with the thing. Now that was thrown out. That was all. So, that was all. so let's not. Let's. Tell, I wanted to deal with the thing that you weren't happy about yep. with me about. So let's just take a look at one of our exchanges yep. in the lobby of the House of Assembly. All right. Yep. Well, I'm not. I have no idea what she's talking about. So you did not do that. I did not do that. I have no idea what she's talking about. So today at cabinet, you didn't I tell your at cabinet. Okay. So at that time, uh, you were angry with me because I said that you had ratted out yep. Ms. Gamma Walsh, yep. right? Turns out you didn't, is what you're, you're claiming? Uh, uh, in, on the uh, April 25th, when she made the uh, complaint to the Premier, yeah. she came down to caucus and she said, I just made a complaint to the Premier in front of caucus. Uh, I gave people names uh, that, that heard it. Uh, Andrew Parsons heard it. Uh, uh, Steve Crocker heard it. Well, Brian I can't Moore. tell you who, but I've spoken to other members of caucus who confirmed that that, that did happen. happen. And, and because of that, because it, and if you remember that day when I went in the House of Assembly, Paul Davis then said, well, Eddie Joyce put out her name, right. which was absolutely false. Why does this matter? Well, it, it matters to me because that's the day that, that Dwight Ball asked me, uh, and I removed myself from caucus. That's we when he kicked you out. Kick, she, she was so upset because I released her name, which yeah. is absolutely false. But then again, that matters to me because that shows the credibility that when Miss Gam Walsh stands up in front of all the media mm -hmm. and says, well, Eddie Joyce was someone, uh, put out my name, but yet the day before, she did it herself. Last question then. Did Dwight Ball throw you under the bus? Is that how you feel? Uh, I, I, I don't think, uh, at the beginning of it all, I don't think Dwight Ball realized that the, uh, uh, that the, um, this stuff was going to be leaked. Uh, when it got leaked, uh, I, I, I firmly believe that it could have been handled differently. Do you still think of Dwight Ball as a friend? Well, you know, I don't wish anybody any harm. I, right. I don't wish anybody any, any harm. Uh, but, you know, like Dwight Ball uh, said the other night that, you know, many times over the last 20 years that uh, I've been with him, any, any situation, I yeah. was always by his side. Sometimes you've got to stand up for your friend when they're right. in a situation. So well, like this week you said that he said the allegations were BS. And he he did. did. He denied that. Uh, but you notice that, that you, but when you notice that when you uh, look at uh, what he said to Chester Crosby, he never denied it in question period, uh, which you have. And you notice even Dwight Ball in, in the answer that he said, the allegations changed 
which is 100% correct. Troy Buckle confirmed it. I confirmed it. So all the all this here, and when Dwight Powell uh, were asked the question this week, he did, he couldn't deny that. He, and he never denied it with Chess Crosby. And and uh, I, I think uh, someone in the uh, tweeted that he'd been asked three times same question, and he kept kept talking until his time right. He he, right. he couldn't deny. It. All yeah. right. Well, obviously, Mr. Joyce, you've uh, set something else in motion with your letter demanding an apology. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what happens next. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and thank we'll do that again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, there it is. The stormy weather didn't stop the annual Christmas tree lighting ceremony at Confederation Building tonight. And if uh, she hasn't blown away, we're going to check back in with Carolyn Stokes. Welcome back, everyone, and it is time now to head back to Confederation Hill for the annual tree lighting ceremony. Here now is Carolyn Stokes is standing by live. Carolyn, you're a trooper tonight, <laughs> uh, bright and colorful and uh, tad breezy. Oh boy, it is not nice. I, I said it before, the weather outside is frightful tonight, but the lights are just delightful. 60,000 uh, lights just lit up here on Confederation Hill. They uh, had the countdown and uh, people came out just for a few minutes. Everyone's back inside now. Uh, so these lights are going to be spanning from the Christmas tree here right down the parkway, uh, 60,000 of them. So if you are thinking about maybe coming out tonight and having a look maybe not <laughs> maybe just stay home uh, and keep warm tonight and maybe go out for a little drive tomorrow night and have a look at all of the lovely uh lights so as i said everyone is inside right now a five-year-old natalia williams she was the one who uh flicked the switch she's from labrador city i was just talking with her and uh she loved it she had a great time and said there was nothing to it at all so i think i'm gonna go inside now i saw some hot chocolate on the go in uh, the confederation uh, uh -huh. building lobby so i think that's a really good idea right now don't you to I, go and get, get a little bit warm I think <laughs> and you, out of I, all of this weather so i think you've earned it Carolyn. that's what i'm gonna do yes you definitely earned it <laughs> what's that you've definitely earned it i did earn it for sure Maybe two. <laughs> <laughs> definitely need a hot chocolate so signing off from here Merry Christmas. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>
you got off kind of easy tonight. Uh, <laughs> look at Carolyn. I was thinking that exact thing as I was watching her outside. I'm like, shouldn't that have been the meteorologist? Yeah. Well, you she, dodged one. I did. It's a great sport. That's right. But then, think about it. I wouldn't have been able to tell you what was going on because I would have been distracted by the weather. That's but, true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but as far as uh, what we're going to see heading towards the next couple of days, we're going to stay in this cold pattern. So it looks like more snow is on the way, and it's going to get uh, pretty bad up through parts of the coastal Labrador. So take a look at the future tracker heading into uh, Friday night into Saturday. We can start to see that system uh, move towards the coast and with this those winds are going to pick up and uh, some of the models are pointing at upwards of like 30 plus centimeters of snow by the end of the weekend. So it's just going to continue uh, and then we're going to see more snow for the island and then this system will continue to track further south and then that will be the next weather maker for parts of the island as well. So if we take a look at the forecast for Saturday, those winds will really pick up, ramping up about 80 to 100 kilometers per hour, so near zero visibility expected with that uh, heavy snowfall. Minus seven for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Lab City uh, gonna stay out of it for now. It looks like mix of sun and cloud and cold though, sitting around minus 20. Uh, for the island on Saturday, we're gonna see some uh, lingering flurries for the west coast and then uh, that next system moves in. So more snow on the way, light snow for uh, parts of the Buren and then uh, even into the Avalon as well. So it looks like a temperature sitting around minus one through the afternoon, minus four for Grand Falls, Windsor. Uh, and it does look like a mix of sun and cloud for the most part there. We'll see some more uh, scattered activity heading uh, into Sunday, it looks like, as this system continues to track a little bit further south. Now, those winds are gonna stay quite strong, as I mentioned, through Sunday. And then even into Monday as well, we'll see some pretty strong winds. So it's it's that long uh, snowfall is why uh, we've got that uh, advisory in place up along the coast. <clears throat> so taking a look, even a little bit further ahead, we can see more moisture making its way in on Tuesday. And with these cooler temperatures staying below zero, it looks like uh, we're going to see all of this snow stick right around at least into next week. So here's a look at the forecast heading towards uh, midweek next week, sitting below zero, as I mentioned, between minus one and minus three as the afternoon highs. Might see some sun peak out on Monday and Tuesday. Otherwise, we're looking at more snow uh, for the weekend. Now for uh, central Newfoundland, that snow will move in on Saturday, continue through Sunday and then late day Monday that risk moves in again. Those overnight lows though, uh, dipping into the minus double digits for the most part. And then we're gonna see that for uh, Western Newfoundland as well as far as the snow goes, looks like a pretty gray next couple of days with that chance of flurries on Monday and Tuesday, that'll taper to the chance of flurries rather, uh, sitting in the minus single digits right across the board. Now up through Labrador, again, as I mentioned, especially for coastal Labrador, uh, that long period snow, somewhere between 30 to maybe even 40 centimeters of snow is possible. Uh, towards Happy Valley Goose Bay, we won't see as much snow and the winds won't be as bad, but still looking at 20 plus centimeters. And then Monday, tapering to flurries with that uh, sun peaking out at times. Same for Tuesday and then temperatures sitting around minus 12. Now into uh, Western Labrador, not a whole lot going on. It does look like lots of sunshine in the forecast, but with that sun comes uh, those colder temperatures. We're looking at minus 20s, minus 30s into the overnight for the weekend. So those wind chills will be pretty significant. So let's look at your long range forecast. We'll look at your weather photo coming up in a little bit. Deb. Thanks, Ashley. Well, there's another medical breakthrough on the horizon. Researchers in Australia have developed what they call a 10-minute test for detecting cancer. It's cheap because it almost uses no equipments. We use 10 microliters of nan nanoparticle solution, which is few cents. The test uses a combination of gold particles and water mixed with a blood sample to help identify the presence of cancer cells. It doesn't identify the kind of cancer, so other tests are still needed, but scientists call the test a breakthrough. Clinical trials and other studies are still needed, so it will be several years before this test might be ready for general use. But it is something positive to look forward to in the incredibly changing world of medical science. Oh, one of those. That's a red sky at morning, sailor take warning. That was this morning. 
Really? Oh, mm -hmm. must be near us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that was your hint. <laughs> Beautiful colors. No idea. Yeah. No. All right, we'll tell you where this shot, it very much looks different right now, but I'll tell you where this is from coming up in a little bit. That beautiful shot one more time. No guesses no. yet. No, but I did say it had to be close to us when you said red sky and morning <laughs> sailors warning. Yeah. Probably yeah, looks different in, right now. It totally does. I'm sure it's blowing, uh, blowing around. Yeah. So in Trapassi, red sky and morning this morning. Uh, that was sent in by Clifford Doran. Nice shot, Clifford. Yeah. Thank you for sending that in. If you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. I'm sure. We're going to get a bunch of winter wonderland photos tomorrow from That'd the be Avalon. Good to get. I yeah. hope so. Send them in. Definitely. Good night, everyone. Good night.